Welcome to Two Local Radio. I'm your host, Ray Ray. And I'm Chrissy D. And Teppo and Snow are running a bit late. But today we have a very special interview because we have none other than the world-renowned Ken Pike from... Absalon. You know, the goth power metal band. Hello, Ken. How's your night going? Hi, how you doing? I'm doing really good. I'm doing really good. Thank you for that incredible... Uh, intro. <laughs> You're welcome. We're glad to have you here. Wow. And and by the way, I don't have the goatee anymore. <laughs> oh, you don't? <laughs> no. You probably oh. heard me. No, I I I, uh, I got rid of the goatee, so now I'm. But I'm still bald. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I thought you were cool. I liked it. <laughs> what? Well, I, I, w- I was telling her during the setup that he probably could hear us. <laughs> I wasn't sure who was who. <laughs> uh, I got really good ears. <laughs> you got ears like him. He's like that too. All right. Well, uh, I'll start the interview, and I'm gonna throw. Uh, I'm gonna throw uh, probably a, a question you hear all the time. But uh, how has your music evolved since leaving Vi- the band Vital Signs? Vital signs. Wow, that was like, I, how many years ago is that? Like, I've lost count. Um, well, uh, since way back since Vital Signs, since Vital Signs uh, was more of a um, kind of like a journey. It was like journey meets, uh, I don't know, you know, that 80s, early 80s uh, music. Um, but after that, I got into uh, my first heavy metal band called Malachiah. And um, it was where I got my first taste of uh, doing European type uh, heavy metal. So uh, from there, the, went into the la- when I moved to Florida, the last band that I was in for about six years was called Turnpike, and I call it affectionately Chick Rock. It was kind of like alternative Dave Matthews type type music. It, it was. I, I just totally went away from heavy metal, which I is crazy when I think back now. Uh, so my, I, I guess I've evolved in a whole lot of different ways. I know I've, I think I've uh, through the years gotten better as a songwriter, and definitely as a singer. When I first started singing, I couldn't sing my way out of a paper bag. So uh, kind of like me. Oh, it, it was it was bad. But I I just got stuck in every band I was ever in, all, all the way back to garage bands. Um, for some reason, I got stuck being the the vocalist, the lead vocalist in all these bands, even though I couldn't sing because nobody else wanted to do it. <laughs> and uh, but it's progressively gotten a little better, so I think I can kind of sing a little bit now. <laughs> I'd say your voice is real good. I heard some of your music; I liked it. I want to okay. know how did you get the name Absalon? I like that. Um, I was re- and I can't remember the name of the book now. I was uh, I was reading a I. I believe it was a Dean Koontz book. And there was one little part, and they were talking about Bishop Absalon. And um, it was spelled A-B-A-S-L-O-N. And I thought, that's a cool name, Absalon. So I just t- changed the A to an O and became Absalon. It wasn't until later that I found out it also was a really bad sci-fi movie. And oh, cool. Yeah, so, but I, I uh, with that Lambert guy that played uh, Tarzan, or, and uh, I, I didn't know it was, uh, it was this bad movie, too. So, oh, uh, so, you, so you must have got some slack account of it. Uh, well, I had, yeah, I've had a few people ask me, well, did you name the band after that movie? It's like, no, 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 that, that, that movie was terrible, so. But no. So Bishop Absalon, that's where it came from. That's awesome, because you know what? I love your picture where you guys are all standing in the background and you see the black clouds and everything. I mm. think that's awesome. Is that the, is it the one that's on the website or on the uh, our Facebook right now? Yeah. It's, it, it's the one that's actually on the website. Okay, it's the one that's got the, the mansion-looking thing in the back? Yeah. Oh, yeah, those are brand, brand new pictures that uh, we... Uh, we put up. Um, I thought I looked kind of goofy in the picture, but I, I ah, like you they look... were all standing. So, no, you look mean. You all look like you're really mean. Like you're just like tough guys. Like you know, uh, like we're it? ready to rock. Come on, let's go. You know. 
Yeah, it's a way of heavy metal bands. We're all supposed to be, look mean. You know, in the 80s, it was the hair bands and all looking like girls. So now we just look mean. So. <laughs> not that we're... But 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 at least you're not screaming. Exactly. We can understand what you're saying. You know. No, I I don't do the uh, I don't do the, the the screaming thing. That's about here in Florida uh, where I'm at. Um, most of all the metal bands here in Florida is the uh, the screaming demon from the pit of hell voices, and um, not not from my, it's not where I come from. So uh, I'm I'm old school me- uh, heavy metal. So. Um, I sing. Yeah, yeah, you can't even understand them. That's no disrespect to those that do that, but you just can't understand what the hell they're saying. Exactly. There's a big audience for, you know, there's an audience market for that that kind of music, obviously. Um, you know, so I, I don't put it down. It is what it is, just not my cup of tea. So, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm an old Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, Queensryche throwback, so... Yep, I saw that. That's cool. Oh, okay. Um, one thing that I noticed, I don't know if you, anybody's ever asked you in during an interview, but are you a George Carlin fan? And if you are, do you share his beliefs? A uh, who? George Carlin. Oh, George Carlin. Yeah. <laughs> I used to love George Carlin. <laughs> I, he, he's uh, uh, kind of like John Stewart a little bit. You know, he could take the most simplest thing to kind of the duh type things and make put it into comedy and make you go, God, oh, well that that makes sense. <laughs> so yeah, I guess I am a little bit of a George Carlin fan. That's awesome. Yeah, because I seen a picture up on uh your Facebook, you know, with them there and I'm like I wonder if they share some of the same views. Um yeah, I think probably and we, I share a lot of the same views he had on uh, on a lot of different topics. <laughs> Well, he was he was right on the money though. If you're looking at today's you know world, he's right on the money. Sure was. I I agree with you. Um, you know, he was just really straightforward, and he just uh, he just said it, and and it made sense. You know, he he could talk to you at the is a real person, and um, actually I like John Stewart too. I I think in his comedy is also kind of the same way where you go, well, oh, yeah, that's right, you know, but. I'm a, I'm a bit of a throwback. Oh. oh, okay. I have I have another question for you. I'm just curious. Are you a Freemason? Yes, I am. Awesome. And wh- and what does that mean to you? For anyone that doesn't know what that is. Oh my goodness. Um, I've been a a Mason since 1990. Um, I. To me, being a Mason just is uh, one of the tenets of Masonry is making a, a, a good man better. And um, I think it's just a, um, it's an organization that does good things um, for people. And it's about, you know, the spirit of uh, kindness and, uh, you know, helping your, your fellow man uh, type of a thing. I've taken... Um, I, I normally, through the years, I very rarely have discussed um, my being a, a Mason. And it was actually, it was recently, probably over the last five, six months, that I started posting anything on my, my Facebook. And I, and I took some flack from uh, some, I've got some very, very dear, um, good Christian friends, or good people, but I took some flack, you know, that, you know, you're part of a satanic organization, the conspiracy to take over the world, and all this other stuff. I'm like, I haven't seen that in all the years I've been a Mason, you know. But um, that's not that's not what it's about. So, uh, yeah, yeah, you're actually you're the first. Uh, no one's ever asked me that question <laughs> in an interview. <laughs> Wow. Like, well, I, I didn't. I didn't mean to throw you off, but I, I just wanted, you know, because I, I'm not a. I, I don't have a belief that there is like this evil satanic. No, me either. You, you know, people taking over. I think it's just a bunch of you know YouTube people that use uh, like a Photoshop. Exactly, because you know what? Back in the late '80s, my friends um, and his father and uncle and everybody were part of the Shriners and the Masons and all that. And they went to the hospitals and raised money. They did every, They did all this good stuff. So people need to stop giving them such bad slack, you know? Well, it's just that it's always had a, uh, you know, this thing about it being 
a you know, secret organization and all this other. And actually, it isn't. I mean, there's nothing really secret about the Masons. You, you could go to the library now and find books that go through all the stuff you know that Masons do. Um, exactly. So it's really I, not a secret. <laughs> exactly, because you know what? I mean, the kid I dated when we were dating. I went to all, I went to half the stuff the Shriners had because his mother went, I went, his aunts went, you know, everybody went and we just did a big thing. We all helped out with whatever uh, organization or whatever they were doing, you know? Yeah, and that's what Masons do. Um, you know, it's just, uh, like I say, good men are making a good man better. And uh, it's not a religion. You know, I've, ha- I've heard that from people. Oh, well, it's a religion because you have a... Um, you know, you have a the Bible or whatever um, in your uh, rituals and stuff like that. It's like, well, no, it's not just that. It's it's actually any any of the books. Um, it, religion, it, there's no religion or politics discussed within Lodge, um, and that's the whole idea of everyone's equal, no matter. I could be sitting next to the president of the United States in in Lodge. And we would be equal as brother masons, and that's something that's really cool about it. You know, everyone. Okay. Here. All right. Well, I mean, I just wanted to know. I was just curious. I'm like, because I hear all this bad stuff, and I'm like, wait a second, yeah, this no. don't make no damn okay. sense. To me. Uh, it's all bull. You know what? I salute you worship. and all your masons. <laughs> I'm I'm not a Satan worshiper. You know, just because I play heavy metal, I'm not a Satan worshiper. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but what I'm saying is because of all the good things you guys do, you know? That's why I, say I salute you guys for it. Thank you. All right, so so would you say that uh, Queen's Reich was a major influence as far as, like, your vocals? Oh, yeah. Um, my first major influence was uh, Sticks. Um, when uh, I got into Sticks and I wanted to sing, um, I liked the way Dennis DeYoung sang, the keyboard player, so I started emulating his voice. And um, then when I discovered Queens Reich, and I, I got into Queens Reich when they were still kind of, um, you know, not an underground band. I mean, they were starting to get move up the ladder, but they'd put out their first EP. And uh, when I heard Jeff Tate's voice, it was like, oh, that's the direction I, I want to go. I like that clean, almost operatic uh, kind of singing. And so, yeah, I would say that Jeff Tate, Queens Reich, um, has been a major influence on on both my writing and, and my vocals. Okay, now now you mentioned some bands, but you didn't mention Operation Mindcrime. Is there a reason for that? Oh no, well, actually, um, our our debut CD, our, our the CD that we have out right now, um, I kind of based it, the idea, the concept of it on Operation Mindcrime. Um, I wanted it to be a concept um, CD and to have different movements throughout the CD, you know, the intro, um, intros, interludes, and little speaking pieces and stuff. Um, I, I mean, I, I think Operation Mindcrime was next to uh, uh, Rage for Order, which was the album before that, um, are there two, the two best Queen's Reich albums. Operation Mindcrime is to me still incredible. So... Yeah. All right. Um. So, so that's where you came up with the album. Uh. You know, from listening to uh. You know, Queens and everything. Because I was wondering why it was story driven. Well, the yeah, the the concept came um, from the idea of Operation Mind Crime, um, but it 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 kind of just evolved. Um, naturally, I I had after Turnpike broke up, I I had put away music for probably about two two and a half years, um, and I didn't play. And one night, for some reason, I just decided I wanted to bang on my guitar, so I put on my guitar and I turned it, you know, put on the distortion. And um, that night, I wrote "Darkness Rising" the uh, off the CD. Then I wrote three songs after that and I thought well I'll just do like a little four song thing put it out there and see if anyone even cares um, but I noticed that all four songs it seemed like there was a theme going on through the four songs um, I, I don't know whether that was unconsciously or what but it was a theme so once I decided well I'm just going to go for it and do a whole album um, I decided to uh, 
do the concept. The story is based on you know the the classic story of the the portrait of Dorian Gray, um, and that so that's what the the idea, the whole um, concept of uh, um, the main character Derek, you know, selling his soul to become a, a famous metal guy and. Then at the end, you know, he decides he doesn't want to do it anymore, but he can't escape from what he's done, and then he dies. But uh, well, he kills himself. It's, it's kind of a kind of a dark, sad story, actually. But uh, so that's where that's where it came from. But I, I did uh, base it on the idea of Operation Mindcrime um, in the way I put it together. I didn't want to do an exact copy of Operation Mindcrime. Um, because I don't think that can be duplicated, but I wanted something kind of like that. So that's where that all came from. It, it kind of reminds me of a more, um, you know, ballad type uh, you, uh, Life of Agony. Have you ever heard of that band? Mm, no. Well, when Life of Agony uh, did their first album, they did a story, story driven, and it, you know, ended up around the same way, but it wasn't all melodic it was more of a you know screaming so okay <laughs> and life adventures like his his girlfriend breaks up with him he loses his job everything just his mother's yelling at him stuff like that <laughs> so wow <laughs> but so i mean so what made you want to go from classical music when you were a kid to you know picking up metal out of all music cuz that's like so far away from each other. Um. Well, when I was young, when I was a kid, I mean, I started banging away on a piano when I was really little. But um, when I discovered, uh, like probably a lot of bands, uh, but when I discovered the Beatles, that's when I got into rock and roll. And um, I was and still am like a Beatle nut. But then from the Beatles... I, I started getting into, um, in, you know, in the middle, late 70s and that, but I started, you know, I got into Boston and Foreigner and, um, you know, bands like that, Fog Hat and stuff, um, and then really Ted Nugent, you know, into that kind of rock. Um, and then, of course, in the 80s, early 80s, is when I got into Judas Priest and Iron Maiden. And that that's when I discovered that, okay, this is what I really want to do this is what i love you know i'm love heavy metal i want to be a headbanger you know but it's that i i like the old school i like the european sounding metal i i was never into the la metal bands the whole you know what we call hair bands i was never into those kind of bands it was all the european metal uh bands that i was into uh, i like that i guess because it has a classical sound they they utilize classical stuff in 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 their metal and uh, that's how I got from point A to point B of becoming a metalhead, and I'm still a metalhead. So, w would you say uh, nowadays bands have a disadvantage that you you had at one point? So, you know, uh, with the Headbangers Ball, with MTV going all to uh, reality television now. <coughs> um, I think actually now uh, bands have. Uh, a much better opportunity to, uh, with you know, with the internet and the social networks and everything, uh, to get their music out there to the uh, a lot more people. And I mean, there was a time in the '80s we didn't, of course, have all this kind of stuff. So you had to put together, you know, promotion a promo package. You had to mail them, you had, or physically take them to places, and um, it was a lot. And then, of course, you had to play a lot. You know, that was the big thing. Is you played all the time to build an audience nowadays you know you you got reverb nation and facebook and twitter and i mean all these different things that you can put your music out on and it and it goes to people all over the world uh real real different so i think actually there's more an advantage today than there was then um you know i mean mtv the whole headbangers ball was was pretty cool but um i wish they still had something like that but uh, it'd be kind of fun to have something on there, but I don't know whether it was an advantage though back then. 
so so you think uh, social media today is more of an advantage, but isn't it a disadvantage at the same time with everything being so digital and uh, less, you know, albums being sold? Um, well, I think what it's doing, it, it, another advantage for bands, especially independent bands like us, um, in a way it kind of cuts out the middleman where before, you know, it, everything was about getting that record deal and, uh, you know, getting signed by the major label and all that, which actually could, was, could be a curse, too. Um, nowadays, you know, you can do, a, an independent band can almost do everything themselves, uh, you know, to, from putting together the CD, releasing the CD, promoting the CD, selling the CD, and in a way you, it cut, they're cutting out the middleman, the record company. Because um, a lot of people, they don't understand that getting a record deal doesn't mean anything because it's like a bank. You know, the record company, they'll invest, you know, ever a couple of hundred thousand or whatever into you. But you got to pay that back. Uh, it, it's not like you make any money. So you can go out and tour, you do everything, sell c- CDs, but the company's got to get their money back. So this way, you know, when we sell merchandise, we sell our CDs, it's just, it's profit. You know, that's money we make. Of course, it goes back into the band. But uh, so there's even a big advantage there than there used to be. Not that I wouldn't mind being on a major label; it'll be kind of cool. But um, it's not a goal or anything like that at this point. Be, be, like be, because it's not needed anymore. In a lot of ways, no. I mean, gosh, you got all these. You got iTunes and Spotify and Shazam. I mean, all these different um, internet outlets that you can put your music on and sell it. You know, or you could sell the CD. You could sell just a song. Um, then you got your website, you got all these other uh, ways of selling CDs and um, and promoting. You know, it's a little easier now to promote uh, your music in, in the, the band or the artist than it used to be. Um, I mean, I remember the days when you go out and promotions was putting, spending a few hours putting flyers on everything. It didn't move. You know, uh, that was promotions. Now you just do electronic flyers and you send it out to your 5,000 people on your Facebook friends list, you know. And uh, so I think there's just more advantages today than there was, you know. You don't have to hoof it as hard, I don't think, in the sense of actually going out places and stuff. But um, I don't know, though. I kind of miss it. Uh, sometimes I miss the good old days, you know. So... So why don't you uh, why don't you tell us uh, about one of them you know times where a road trip like an interesting story on a road trip? Oh wow, there's a whole lot of those. I, uh, pl- being a, a, a court in the the Malachi the van I was the metal band I was in in the um, mid '80s or so. Um, that was uh, you know Los Angeles, so we played Hollywood, you know, um, all the clubs and Sunset Strip and all that all the time. It, very different there than in a lot of places in the country, like even especially here in Florida. Um, you Bands would sabotage each other. If you were playing if, uh, with a band that uh, if they thought you, you, know, you were a really good band um, and they were playing with you, you you'd find equipment missing. Uh, there was times that we found all our stage clothes in the uh, garbage bin out back in the alley. We had wow. uh, guitar strings cut. Um, had guitars missing, <laughs> um, you know, because uh, one time we had the drummer, somebody sliced all the heads on his drums. <gasps> yeah, that that was that was the way it was in Los Angeles. So I got a lot, <laughs> and then just all the crazy stuff that went on behind the scenes um, at at the clubs um, on Sunset Strip. Um, there was a. There was a, a documentary that came out quite a few years ago, but it was all about the 80s metal scene. And whenever it's on, I, I watch it because it, that's exactly the way it was. Um, just It was crazy uh, on, the, on the Sunset Strip down there in all the clubs. And sadly, some of the clubs aren't there anymore. They're Gazaris, and uh, a number of the big clubs are gone. You know, But I got a lot of fond memories. So would you say it was a, a battle, you know, a, a battle of, uh, you know, the strongest band at that time or the smartest band? Uh, it was definitely because every band wanted to get, you know, get signed. And there was constantly it shows, uh, you know, A&R people, there's different you know, record company people would be showing up to shows that, for, of different bands. And if you started, if you had a buzz and you had a good audience and, and you 
you were a good man, you could almost be guaranteed that there was probably some scout watching you. Um, so everybody wanted to get signed. So it was, uh, you know, kill or be killed. And um, very competitive. It's very different here in Florida. It's like here, it, it's all, the bands are all about supporting each other and, hey, go to each other's shows and, and you know, and it's, I'm not used to that. It's it's really uh, alien to me coming out of the scene I did, you know, in L.A. But uh, I like it a lot better. At least I don't have to worry about someone cutting the strings on the guitars and, you know, throwing my stage clothes into this trash can in the back. So uh, Or slicing the drummer's drums. Yeah, oh, that was something that night. It was, I mean, it, we were getting ready to put our stuff, you know, stage on, our gear on the stage. And the drummer was like, "Man, somebody!" So we didn't uh, we didn't know what to do. So luckily, one of the other bands that we were playing with, they were nice enough to let him use his, uh, their kit. So that was good. Other we wouldn't have been able to play. Well, that was unusual. But um, they go, "Oh man," because they felt really bad for us. You know, it wasn't right. So they let us use their kit. You know. So would you say this is the fans doing that, or you just think that the the bands were doing that so they got the spotlight and you didn't, or how how do you think that worked out in L.A. at that time? Uh, you know, I, I think it was just vindictiveness. You know, bands uh, that were maybe not all that as good, or it was their way of. I really, yeah, honestly, I don't know. I think it was just it was just pure meanness. Um, it, it's just, I think they thought, well, if they could, if they could sabotage your 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 set so that you you couldn't play or you sounded too bad, you know that, I mean, you wouldn't get rec- a record deal. I don't really know, but it happened all the time, you know. But that was a long time ago. <laughs> I think it's different now. I don't think. Bad Still, it's a shame that people are so childish, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it was uh, it was pretty unbelievable, but yeah, you know, it happened a few times with us. You know, it was something different. Um, but overall, I got a lot of really good memories of, of that time. It was pretty exciting um, per- period of time uh, to look back on. You know, good memories. So, would you say that uh, counter you didn't have the metal look? You were in a way bullied or discriminated against when you were trying to uh, interview for different bands. Oh yeah. Um I after vital signs I um I spent probably almost a year auditioning for bands. And uh, there's a number of times it would it would come down to me and one other guy. And they would have us both back uh to do another audition, you know. And it would be I'd be in the same would be in the same room together, you know, auditioning. And it would always be, well, you know, they like my voice and all this other good stuff, but, you know, the other guy had the long hair and, you know, had the look. You know, and I looked more like I was out of Lover Boy or something. So I finally, um, I got tired of it because it was more, mostly because of my hair. And so I, uh, I went and spent a few hundred dollars on this wig, and it looked real. And... Uh, the, I, the first time I wore it was the first time I auditioned for Malachi, <laughs> and I got the I got the gig. And uh, they they really liked my voice. They liked the way I looked. And I I wore that wig for a number of rehearsals, and then um, I wore it. I think I wore it for two shows. It was the second show that I was you know banging my head, and I I felt it like loosening up. So after that, I was worried it was going to fly off, you know, and that would have been a little embarrassing. So um, it was after that, the following rehearsal, I went to rehearsal and I said, "Hey guys, I got something to tell you." So they they thought I was going to I was quitting or I was going to tell them I was you know my into bestiality or something. I don't know. They they were worried what I was going to tell them. They said, they said, "Well, you know my hair. You think it's so cool? Um, it's not real." And I um, I remember them sitting there just like looking at me like Are you, you're crazy what so I I took it off and, and they just sat there and open mouthed and big eyed and like oh my god and uh, so I, you know I hope this doesn't change anything I understand you know if if you guys boot me I'll understand 
And they're like, oh, man, it's cool, because they all had long hair and everything. And they let me stay in the band, and we actually did really well. So, uh, But then Jeff Tay came back. Jeff Tay had short hair. So, you know, it, it, it wasn't I wasn't totally weird. So did uh, um, Rob Palford, you know, from Judas Priest. He had short hair. So Yeah, and, and then if you go, you know, the new age metal, like bands like Pantera. Yeah, I mean, they had the shaved heads. <laughs> exactly. So it really wasn't a big deal. But it was just the scene at the time. You know, again, there in L.A. on uh, the metal bands there, it was all uh, it, it was all about looks. I mean, a lot of the bands couldn't play their way out of a paperback. Um, they were really bad, but it was all about looks. So you had to have the look, and that meant, you know, leather or spandex and stuff like that and long hair, that you could, you know, put a can of hairspray in and puff up all over the place. That was the look. And um, I didn't have that look. I did with the wig, though. I looked pretty good with that wig. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I had it look cool. I looked real, so I had nice long hair. But uh, my long hair days was over. Yeah. You know what, though? I like you better with the shave head. I think you look much better. I think Me. you look good. Yeah, it fits the music and... You know, the shave head still—it's kind of a pain in the butt. You know, I got to shave my head every night, but uh, it's okay. Yeah, but you know what? When it's hot in Florida, it's perfect. <laughs> oh yeah, it is. I I I, I could wear a hat and not sweat my my head off, but I like. Yeah, I've had the the bald look for quite a long time now, and I think it's kind of become my my look. So I I don't think I can even grow hair now. If I did it probably freak everyone out so but but do you ever do you ever like grab like your ha- head and just like hoping that there's hair like there I, I do that from time to time i'm just wondering <laughs> if i'm the only one uh i like actually i like the way it feels the bald feels it's it's um it's kind of cool my what my uh my my uh, wife likes it too so it's like okay just rub my my head when it's yeah, right after shave it's like you know a baby's butt so <laughs> Oh, that might have been a little too much information. <laughs> no, it was funny, uh, actually. Uh, we're, we're live and uncensored, so you can say whatever. It doesn't bother us. Yeah, it doesn't us. matter us. And okay. you know what? Okay. I I keep telling Ray Ray because he's got the hair on the sides and on the back. He needs to go bald and shave it all the way. Yeah, do it. Uh, see? I, I, I can't, man. I look too much like a skinhead. I can't do it. <laughs> no, you don't. He looks good. Hey, bald is beautiful. <laughs> you know, it is. You know, remember back in the day, Telly Savalas and um, the uh, what's his name that played in The King and I uh, that had Yul Brenner. Yeah. Hey, you know they were tough. So <laughs> nobody messed with Yul Brenner. <laughs> no. It seems like every in movies and stuff nowadays, every the hitmen, you know, the muscle, they're all always now they have shaved heads. I guess it's, it's intimidating looking or something. I don't know. Well, Probably. Well, after Bruce Willis and the Diehards, I can understand why. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. There you go. So you got Bruce Willis. He looks good bald. So and he's he's real old, and he still looks. I think looks pretty tough. So he does. He still looks good. Yeah. You know. So I hope I look that good when I'm that age. <laughs> Um, all right, so um, so how did you all meet each other in uh, you know, this band? And are you all close friends, or you just uh, play music and then do your own thing? No, we're um, we're all good friends. Um, we're not just uh, you know, a band that comes together and plays and then you know, never talk to each other. Um, we keep in pretty pretty much constant contact. Well, it started with me. Um, I you know, I started writing the songs and that. And um, as I progressed and got into, you know, got to be eight songs and that, I, I got hold of um, Ed Dumas, the, uh, uh, one of the guitar players. In the picture, he's the one with the, sun, the glasses, sunglasses and the bandana. And he was in Turnpike with me. So I'd, I'd, I've, I've known Ed for many, 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 many years. And um, I had always uh, said that... Uh, he was one of the best guitar players I've I've ever played with through all all the years I've been in music. So I called him. I hadn't talked to him. Well, I hadn't talked to him since Turnpike broke up. So we're talking two and a half years. I hadn't talked to him. And uh, I called him and said, "Hey, this is what I'm doing." And um, you know, 
I'd really like to have you on board um, and be the guitar player. So he uh, he wasn't doing anything at the time, which I was happy about because I really thought he probably was in, was in a band or doing something. And he agreed, and we started working uh, working out parts of the the CD and the songs and everything together. And uh, he, so he he ended up becoming he, I, I, Ed's more like a partner for me. Um, he's a partner in Absalon. And uh, then we brought in a um, a drummer, uh, the original um, drummer, uh, to lay down the drums on the CD. Ed actually did the bass um, on the CD. And the uh, guy that en- did the engineering and mix and mastering and everything in the studio, Dave Michaels, he did all the keyboards that's on there. I didn't, so I didn't really have a band. It was really just me and Ed and that recorded the CD. And, uh, oh, wow. And, yeah, um, and Dave Michaels. And then after it was, re- uh, we got it done and released it, we went in search of a drummer and bass player and a keyboardist and got, we found them and then uh, I, they, they left and then we got a new bass player and drummer and keyboard player and then they had to go. I had to, I had to let them go. Um, I, probably this is right before November um, of last year. And um, then we got the current drummer and bass player. And um, I right now we we we're, well, I don't have a keyboard player. We we've kind of decided to be a five piece band instead of uh, having the next CD is not going to be so much keyboards. It's going to be really more two guitar attack, uh, traditional you know European uh, heavy metal. <clears throat> and Tyler, the other guitar player. Uh, I met him actually at the studio while we were recording and doing the mixing and everything. He was an intern at the studio. And he kept popping in and he'd sit there for a couple hours while we were doing our stuff. And then the very last uh, day that we were doing uh, mastering the CD, he'd come in for a little while. And he got up to get ready to leave. And the, uh, Dave Michael, the engineer, turned around because he knew I was looking for a second guitar player. And he said, you know, Tyler plays guitar. He's really good. Now, I've been seeing this kid. He's 20 years old. And I said, I've been seeing this kid for all this months. And he never said anything about playing guitar. And one thing led to another. Had him come down to rehearsal, and um, he became part of the band. And uh, he, he's he's going to be one to watch in the future. That kid's going to be a um, phenomenal guitar player. He's kind of already a, a whiz kid on the thing. And our drummer, uh, he's 20. So we got two young guns in the band. And have us old farts uh, making up the rest of the band. <laughs> so so that's how the whole band came together. But I got the steady lineup now. I got the killer lineup. Oh, uh, so, so you have uh, the NFL, basically. You have your vets and you have your rookies. Pretty much, yeah. That That's exactly it. And the, the rookies are really good. You know, we drafted them. They're good. And uh, uh, the drummer, um, he... He's killer on those drums, and he he pounds them things. So uh, right now, uh, it's I can tell by the audience's reaction, um, all the shows that we do. Every time we play, it, it's a, it's the funniest thing. Well, normally we play second or third, depends on what, you know how many bands are playing. So the first band will go on and play, and it's like there's nobody there. You know, we're thinking, oh, okay. Well, you know, five people here, whatever. And as soon as we get about halfway into the first song, it's like, where did all these people come from? The place is like just the floor is packed. And um, just the response that we get, I know that I've got the killer lineup now. Um, you know, we get yelled at, you know, people saying, man, that's true metal, real metal, yeah. And it's like, yeah, that's that's a compliment to me. It's like, yeah, I think we're real metal, you know, um, in the sense of heavy metal, so... Um, I got the killer lineup, though. I tell you. All right. So, do you um, do you write all your songs, or do you get them from others, or who does the writing? I uh, I wrote all the songs on the debut CD. Um, this next CD, uh, our bass player uh, John, he's um, you know one of the, the new guys. Uh, he's also a songwriter, 
Now, he was in a really popular band in, up in Philadelphia called uh, Sinister Realm. A uh, really, really good band. But he moved to Florida. Him and his wife moved to Florida, so which is good for me. I got the, I got him. Uh, but he writes. So the next CD we're going to have uh, there'll probably be four, uh, four or five songs by him, and uh, the rest will be my songs. His his songs are were mine are more Queens Reichish prog metal. His are a little more, I don't know, Judas Priest Dio. Um, but we'll turn we'll we'll turn them into you know to Absalon and eyes them you know uh, once I get my voice in there and everything so uh, the really good songs that he's written uh, for the band so and and it's nice not to write all the songs I hate that I I, I hate being the only songwriter in a band it's too much you know pressure having to come up with material all the time so but that's what I do I'm a singer songwriter so. No. <laughs> so, um, as far as uh, you said that you know it's going to change a little, you think that's going to affect how the audience feels about the band? And uh, you, I, we've heard where the idea of Absalon came from. In your opinion, what does it mean to you? What does that name mean to you? And what does the band mean to you? Uh. Well, no, I, I actually, I, I think, if anything, I, th- I think the C- next CD, because we've got all the songs written and we're doing it in pre-production now, um, I think the next CD is going to be better, actually, than um, the debut CD. I think the Strongs are much stronger and uh, more complete. Um, I don't know what Absalon means to me. It, it's, uh, it's, I'm, uh, it's giving me an outlet uh, to do something I love to do, uh, you know, music, um, and in particular heavy metal. Um, I feel like we're, do, we're doing something that people can like. Um, you know, we, we play with so many, and again, I don't mean a disrespect to the, the, the genre of music, the yelling, screaming, that demon voice bands, you know, the, but I think that the younger generation today are ready and hungry for bands that actually have music that has melodies and have, has guitar solos and structured songs. You know, it's not just... Um, not just three chord? Three chord, chug, 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 you know, down, you know, tune down and, uh, you know, detuning and A-tuning and all this stuff. It's like, because you can get the lowest in the tuning. Um and because I the the few th- uh, like we we did a festival a big metal festival here uh, about a month or so ago, and almost every single band that played that day before we went on was the, the yelling screaming stuff, and I tell you every single one of them sounded exactly the same. I couldn't tell where one song ended and another one began. I couldn't tell they were different bands. It could, it could have just been the same band the whole day. Um, and then we got up and played, and it's like people were wow, you know. I I could tell by I mean, young young kids coming up there and they're doing the devil horns, you know, and thrusting their fists and stuff. It's like they're they're hungry for this. They want this, you know. Um, exactly. I mean, I don't like that. Um, my I have very sensitive ears, so I don't like that yelling, screaming. So when Ray Ray first said heavy metal, I'm thinking yelling, screaming. Then he played your music, and I'm like, wow, I love it. This is cool. I like their music. I like the way they play. They're not screaming. You can understand what they're saying. Yeah, it's, you know, I I I try to sing. I don't scream. I couldn't do that if I wanted to, the screaming stuff. It just hurts my throat. <laughs> but I guess it takes a talent to do that, so i got to give them props, you know, for being able to do that because I can't. But I do. I think there's a there's um, there's a, a a hunger from the kids now for for this. I mean, I see you know the young kids twenty you know in their early twenties and that wearing you know now wearing Iron Maiden t shirts and Judas Priest t shirts and uh, yeah. Stan Lizzie and it's like wow you know mm-hmm. you're not even weren't even born <laughs> so you know. But I think we're in a good place at, at at a good time for this kind of music, but 
I don't know if I answered the question or not. I, I, I mean, that one, that's kind of a tough question. What does Absalon mean to me? I think it's just playing, trying to play good music that people can get into and enjoy. And, um, you know, hopefully it succeeds down the road. Um, we got a big following in Europe. You know, we, we're doing, we actually do really well in Europe. So maybe someday getting on a tour in Europe would be nice. Um, oh, I don't know. That would be awesome to have you happen, you know, for you. It, it sounds like you got a, you know, a big following all together. I mean, just on Facebook alone, you've got over twenty thousand likes, and that's not easy to do. No, it's not. It, that always it, it kind of blows me away. But whenever I post, when we hit a, a milestone with the likes, I always post. You know, I'll say we well we've hit ever how many, and but that I still don't know what that means. You know, if it means anything, you know, it, it's kind of cool, you know, um, uh, to me. But, uh, you know, if that would just transpose into, you know, maybe a tour or something like that, would be nice. Um, you know, same with Reverb Nation. Uh, I mean, we've got I don't know how many thousands and fans and stuff on Reverb Nation. But um, so it's all, it's all good. I, I think, again, that goes back to, I think, people, are, you know, they – are looking for this kind of music now. So I just keep doing what we do, you know, and hope it... Uh, but I'm having fun. I enjoy it, you know. I'm, now I'm just a full-time musician. I'm retired, so I'm just a full-time musician. And um, I'm, I'm just... Hey, there's, no, there's nothing wrong with that, you know. You should enjoy your retirement, doing what you do. You love playing music, so why not, you know? Yeah, that's, it, it is. I'm more busy now than when I was working. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I thought you're supposed to like, you know, re- relax, but not. No, I'm I'm busier now, but it's all good. So, well, well, the instrumental part of you know Absalon kind of in a way reminds me of like something like a Dream Theater used to do. Mm-hmm. Well, we're kind of prog. I, I've had a lot of people that um, that tell us they think, uh, but Queen's Reich was really kind of considered prog metal before you know when prog metal was really starting and becoming known as prog metal. Um, they were a different version. I mean, you had Rush and um, Genesis and stuff like that, but it was a different version of prog metal. So I think, yeah, I, I, I had people tell, I mean, Dream Theater, Crimson Glory, you know, of course, Queen's Ride, Judas Priest, Iron Maid. I've heard so many. Um, Kim, Pagan's Mind, which I love Pagan's Mind, uh, <laughs> but different. All these different bands and a lot of prog metal bands. So, um, well, I mean, oh, go ahead. Other than like you know, Life of Agony, when I heard that you know, story driven. The last time I heard story driven, other than listening to um, y'all's music, it was from like Megadeth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, of course. There, there's just uh, political, uh, more political, but yeah. I haven't heard the last CD that that I bought that I heard that was a full on just like this you know full on concept type CD was Judas Priest and Nostradamus, and um, that's it's kind of the same thing. It's a two CD uh, set, but um, the the next closest would be Camelot. Camelot, most of their CDs are theme based. They have it's not necessarily a full on story, but it's very theme based. And I love Camelot too, but um, our next CD will be theme based. It's going to have a theme running through it uh, from song to song. It's not going to be a full blown concept like this one. I, I don't know if I want to do another one of these. It was it was too much. But um, the next one is about uh, um, kind of a Romeo Juliet zombie apocalypse story. So um, it's going to be kind of strange but if you're into zombie love so so uh why don't you describe you know to the audience you know as far as a day in the life of ken pike if you weren't you know on tour doing music oh well i (laughs) i um i got back in uh, november last year i got married and um, I married. Congratulations! Congrats! 
Yeah, I married, uh, her name is Ryo Utisato, and she is uh, Japanese. She lives in Tokyo. So oh. I, flew to, I flew to Japan. We got married in Tokyo. And um, right, we're going through the immigration process right now so, to get her visa, her permanent visa, so she can come over here. And so she, she'll be coming here eventually. And she's a composer. She composes music for movies and uh, TV and stuff like that. Um, she's a real well-known composer in Japan. <coughs> and um, we... So how, so how did you... I don't mean to cut you off. Okay. Yeah, how, how did you meet how, her? How did you meet her? <laughs> oh, my gosh. We got quite the story. I, I, I firmly believe we were meant to, meant to be together, but... Um, the record label that we're on, we're on a little an independent uh, label called Liquid Tree Records in Germany, and I think we've been on the label about a month. And the owner of the label uh, had talked to me one day and said, "Hey, you should get hold of uh, this female composer, Rio Utsada. Uh She's in Japan and she composes music, but she does the, she does the real epic, you know, like big epic movie music." That the, our styles might fit together. Maybe we could collaborate. I said, "Oh, okay, cool." So I sent her an email, and she wrote back and and said she she would be interested in collaborating. And then she sent me a couple of ideas for songs and that. And we started emailing back and forth, and and one thing just kind of started leading to the other, and then um, it, it it sounds really. Uh, kind of storybookish, I guess. Um, but the first time I went on Reverb Nation and I listened to her music, I mean, just incredible, incredible music. And then I, I looked at her pictures and I, I, it, I fell in love with her. <laughs> and then when the first time Aww. we skyped, um, it was like that was it. We it was, I guess, if you want to say there's love at first sight, it's real because we we just that was it. And That's then, sweet. Eventually, we got married, and like I say, we got married in Tokyo, and um, and I went back in this past March and spent the month uh, there in Japan with her, and uh, so Japan's kind of like my second home now. And, That's uh, cool. Then she's coming here, and we uh, we uh, we started a business together uh, called Fire Sphere Productions um, LLC, and uh, uh, when she gets here, we're going to really push and promote that, um, and. Yeah, so the, a day in my uh, in my life right now is uh, I we Skype twice a day, so I'm um, the, the hours are weird. Like right now, it's daytime there, and it's nighttime here. So I'll Skype with her about twelve thirty tonight. Um, it'll be her one thirty in the afternoon. So I stay up until like four o'clock in the morning and sleep wow. until I get up. Then I get up and I'm either. I'm either working on, you know, on music, writing, uh, working with my guitar. I'm on the computer doing. It's it's just I'm nonstop. Um, for until yeah, I that's up. yeah, yeah, kind of like me. I don't ever sleep, so. Yeah, I think he's a vampire. This one here. Well, we're both vampires. Me and me and uh, Rio joke all the time that um, we are creatures of the night. Cause she she's that way. She always has been. But I blame her. I tell her you made me this. You know. I wasn't like, oh, <laughs> well, I met you and we got married. Now I'm a creature of the night. So, uh, but I like it. I like staying up. So That's cool. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm so, can you imagine if you two ever had kids, not saying you will or won't, but if you ever did, can you imagine between your talent and her talent, how talented those oh. kids would be? <laughs> oh, gosh. And it, it'd be a good looking kid, too. She's, I, I think she's beautiful. So. <laughs> Me, I'm sure she is. She's beautiful. So, uh, you know, I don't know if there's any kids in the future, though. I think we're both, we both are kind of like, you know, we feel we're maybe a little past the, I've, I've, I've had enough kids, so I, I, don't need, <laughs> I don't need any more kids. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not saying you'll have them, but I'm just saying between your talent and her talent, oh, my God. All right. So, what would you say to uh, the younger generation that would want, you know, that wants to start a band and whatnot, and how hard it is? What 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 advice could you give them to, you know, lead them on the right track? Um, well, first, I would I would say do it. If it's some, this is um, 
music for me, because I've been playing music, like I said, since I was about seven when I started plunking on a piano. Music for me is not a hobby. It's not a, a passing in, in the night type of a thing. Music for me has always been an absolute 100 percent passion. It's a passion and obsession. Um, even the the times where I put music away for a while, it's like a drug. I, I go back to it. Um, so I would tell any aspiring young musician that's wanting to start a band, uh, get together a group of guys and, um, you know, be passionate about it and don't be scared to follow that dream. You know, There'll be people, because I've, I've had people all through the years about, well, you know, you're not going to make money. When are you going to grow up? When are you, you know, you, this is just a hobby. You know, they they didn't understand. But, you you know, you push through it. Don't listen to what anyone else has to say. If it, just do it. You know, follow your passion, your dream, and in, in, in what you love to do. Um, that's music. That's what music is, you know. Um, yeah, and, and eventually the money will come. You have to build it first, though. It, well, that's it, and it may not, and it may not. I mean, you know, you may end up being like Anvil, and you know, playing forever and uh, never ever hit it really big, just playing, still playing clubs and stuff like that. But don't I? I would say, you know, don't ever let anyone persuade you from your dream. I mean, I'm I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but um, at my age, you know, I'm not giving up on the dream. It, it, and I, I'll be 80 years old, and I'll probably still be pursuing the dream. But um, don't give up on the dream. Put the band together. You know, you're going to have a lot of pitfalls. There's going to be a, um, a lot of downs, ups and downs. There's going to be rejection. Um, but you know what? I, I have an attitude. If, if somebody doesn't like what I'm doing or whatever, to me it's like, yeah, screw you. I don't care whether you like it or you don't like it. I like it, and I enjoy doing it. So for the one person that doesn't like it, there's three that do. So Exactly. You know, just pursue the dream. Life is too short. It really is. I mean, you know what? I'm 43, and this is my dream to have this radio station. Same thing with Ray Ray. He's his dreams to have the radio station. People tell us the same thing. And you know what? We just keep pushing on. We don't care. No, you shouldn't. That's, that's your passion. And you follow your passion. You know, everyone's got opinions, you know, and, and you don't know what their motivations are. You don't know. They're just really miserable people. And they want you to be miserable. And, um, I don't know. I, since I retired, and especially since I met Rio, and just uh, I made a point in my life now where you know I live for the, uh, I, I live for that the day. I let tomorrow worry about itself, um, and, and I, I want to enjoy every minute of the life I have left. You know, and uh, I'm not going to let anyone you know, move me from, and I'm not going to let anyone make me unhappy or bring me down. You know, um, it's just, you know, life's too short. It's not worth it. So I'm a happy guy. I look mean in the pictures, and I play dark, heavy metal, but I'm a happy guy. Yeah, but I bet if somebody pissed you off, you, you'd show them how happy you could be. Uh, well, I did over 30 years of law enforcement, so, yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I would definitely. <laughs> but, you know, there used to be a time in my life where it, I, it didn't take much to, uh, yeah, make me mad. But um, you, it takes a lot of pushing me. You have to really push me to set me off <laughs> anymore. So, uh, you know, it's uh, my fighting days and all that. So it's long behind me now. You don't heal as quickly when you know when you get older. So uh, I know what that feels like. So. <laughs> yeah. So I'd rather make love than anymore. So. <laughs> All right. Well, um, we'd love to have you back on, you know, sometime, Ken. Maybe we can get the rest of the band, you know, together and hear uh, some more of them band stories. Sure. That would be great. I mean, the other guys would probably uh, get a kick out of it, and you can get a different perspective from other people than just me. <laughs> no, no, we, we've appreciated it, you know, tremendously. Yeah, we love having you on, and, you know, Again, congratulations on getting married. That's absolutely fantastic to you and to your wife. Thanks. 
I've had a good time too. It was uh, it's fun, and it's. I don't normally. I, I'm. I've never been a real big interview. Uh, you know, I, I've never really liked doing interviews all that much. Um, but uh, maybe it's just part of my growing older. I don't know. Um, but I did one Tuesday night, and and it was fun. I had a blast, and and tonight I, I've, I've had a blast. So maybe I'm getting over it. <laughs> Well, maybe you're with cooler people that aren't rushing you, and, uh, you know, that's the thing about today's uh, radio, I mean, especially, you know, the fact that things are online, people mm-hmm. don't seem to rush you anymore or try to be like, okay, well, you got to say this, and you can't say this, and it's less freaking red tape. Yeah, or well, you got five minutes to talk, and you want to tell this whole big story, and you can't. You know, we hey, we don't care. You take your time. You can talk as much as you want. We don't care. That that's probably could because the way it was Tuesday night as well. It's probably true because I mean the the interviews that I've done in the past, you know, spent like back during Malachi days and that. Um, it was exactly like that because it was like it, uh, most of the time they would send you the questions they were going to ask, and they t- would tell you, okay, you need to keep it, you know, to answer this question, but you need to keep it within you know like a minute, two minutes maybe. I was like, how am I supposed to explain the? The concept of a CD or, or an album or, or where we came up with this or we came up in, in a minute. It's impossible. You can't. No, oh, I have to be talking really fast and you never want to understand anything I'm saying. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> or I just, you know, there's some of the interviews I do, I go, yeah, well, you know, dude, it's like, it's just metal, man. <laughs> you know, and they go, what? <laughs> you know, I'd act really weird. You know, like, what they, I guess they maybe expected a singer in a metal band, you know. <laughs> well, well, we like we like uh, you know the guests to enjoy themselves, and that's why we talk about you know real you know stories rather than just all music because it it gets boring. And in this day and age, where personality, in my opinion, shines over you know everything else because of digital downloads, you know, mm-hmm. it's just different. Exactly. Not only that, but we'd rather have when. Like you, for instance, we'd rather have the people get to know the real Ken Pike instead of just about the band Epsilon only, you know? We want to know all about you, it's about Epsilon. your band members. Epsilon, sorry. <laughs> I'm getting a little tired. <laughs> and, you know, we want to know a little bit about everybody, you know, not just the band. Well, I, I like it, you know, because there's nothing that I like to talk about more than myself. So, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, we're gonna let you go, not because you know we're rushing you out of here, but because you, we want to make sure you can make your call with your old lady. Oh, yeah, yeah definitely. that's right. You got about thirty minutes, <laughs> and then uh, it'll be time to to Skype until three thirty. So well, there you go. I bet you I'll have some steamy Skype conversation. <laughs> Wait, well, the Skype is. You know, I, I tell you what, Skype is a beautiful thing. Much, much better than the phone. <laughs> and I'll leave it at that. Yeah. There you go. I was to try to put you on on this, you know, on the spot and everything. Yeah. I would say though, if if you didn't mind, or if your band didn't mind, we'd love to have like, I I know it's like the new school and everything, but we'd love to you know have an autograph, you know, copy of the CD if that's possible. Oh, sure, no problem. Just uh, um, shoot me your ma- email or wa- uh, message me your the mailing address. Of course. We love it. Yeah. We, we we appreciate that. We we treat that like our Grammys. We don't need huh. to be on our award ceremonies. The fact that these, you know, you know that great talent such as yourself and, you know, Absalon, you know, is willing to give little old us, uh, you know, something so, oh. you know, memorable. Yeah, that yeah, you know, you know, we're just a little old band, so you know, heck yeah, and we uh, we're having um, a, a a bunch of new uh, new merchandise made um, right now, and I should have some other stuff actually Tuesday, so I'm, I'll I'll get you an autograph CD. Uh, actually, I'll get you two because there's two of you, so and maybe throw in a couple of special surprise goodies. Oh, that that would be awesome! Awesome. I'm like yeah. a little, I'm like a little kid in a candy store. I'm like, I can't wait. <laughs> Me too. My face just lit up. I was like, ooh, awesome. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Yeah, just uh, make sure I get your address and and um, 
uh, just give me a couple of weeks so I can get some of this other stuff that I and I'll I'll, I'll, I'll shoot you guys some stuff. Uh, we, we appreciate it. Thank, thank yes, you so we much. Do. Thank Ho- you. Hopefully next time uh, when we can get you know the band on uh, our other part of our crew. You know, Tempo and Snow show up. Uh, for some reason, they they must be having some kind of uh, issues because they were supposed to be here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, that would yeah. be fun. I can get a couple of the other guys on. All right. Well, it's been a pleasure speaking with you, uh, Ken. Is there any last words or anything you'd like to say to your your, uh, your fan base? Uh, well, I for – the, the ones that are out there that know who we are and, um, you know, support us, we, we sincerely appreciate, you know, support. And for the any new fans maybe we made tonight, uh, we appreciate their support. Because uh, I don't care how big a band is, they had to start somewhere and they didn't get there without the fans. People buying their CDs and coming to their shows, you know. So um, that that's something that I'm, I'm very... Uh, particular about and very appreciative of um i always wanted you know, like after shows and stuff i like taking time to go out and talk to people um because they're 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 supporting us you know so um i'm not you know howdy towdy and all that you know my nose up in there just because i play in a band <laughs> but, that's awesome you definitely got a fan over here because i'm definitely a fan i know ray ray's a fan yeah it, it, <laughs> exactly well i and i appreciate it we all do so uh, I think that's that's about it. You know, we just we appreciate people, everyone that supports us. So, all right. Well, well, thank you for coming on uh, to local radio, Mr. Uh, Ken Pike, and we do appreciate everything. And like I said, later on down the road, uh, we'll definitely like to you know hear not only you but the entire band or as many as uh, possible. And just get a uh, you know a little discussion and see how you all actually mesh together. Okay, <laughs> no, that would be fun. I'm sure some of the guys would definitely uh, would love to do it. All right. Well, you have yourself a good night. Okay, have a good well, night. Soon. <laughs> Thanks.